raised um, the things that I did, but oh well. All right. Uh, is this, yeah, it's on the right side. A simplicial object in some category C is a functor, say x, from delta op into C. What is such a thing? All right. So I'm going to write, well, we have to say what it does on objects in maps. So I'm going to write x lowercase n for xn, because this is going to get bulky. All right. Now, each map in delta op corresponds to a map in delta. And from the, previous, from the proposition we had up before, um, <clears throat> it follows that all of the maps in the image of, of this functor uh, factor as a composition of the images of D ops and S ops. So we'll write D, OK, now we've just sort of switched the subscripts and superscripts around. <coughs> and this is going to be a map from xn to xn minus 1 for, uh, we're right, so we're writing this for x of din up. And we're going to do the same thing for the co-degeneracy map. So we have a map from xn to xn plus 1 for x s i n op. So I'm going to call this, this is going to be a face map. And this is going to be a degeneracy map. Let's see, map. And that's why we called them coface and co degeneracy in the simplex category. All right. <coughs> and so again, for each n, there's one of these for i from 0 to n inclusive. All right. And these satisfy the simplicial identities. Which are the co-simplicial identities the other way around. So we have d i d j is d j minus 1 d i for i less than j. We have S i S j equals S j S i minus 1 for i greater than j. And then for d i S j, we have S j minus 1 d i for i less than j. We have the identity for i equals j or j plus 1. And we have sj di minus 1 for i greater than j plus 1. OK, great. Uh, that's just what a functor into some category is. So um, possibly more instructively, uh, diagrammatically, we can say this looks like something. So this looks like, so we have x0, and then we have x1. And all of the interesting maps here, well, there's one degeneracy, and there's two face maps. So we have d0, s0, d1, 
51. And then if we go to x2, well, now we have two degeneracy maps, one face and three face maps. So this is d0, s0, d1, s1, d2. And that continues on. You sort of get one more degeneracy map each time you go up and one more face map each time you go up. <coughs> OK. So we should talk about an example of this. But to get to an example, we need to talk about some topology. So the standard n-dimensional simplex is the following. I'm going to write for it this. And it's the set of coordinates in Rn plus 1 such that the sum of the xi's is 1 and xi is greater than or equal to 0 for all i. Is that still in the recording? Yeah, good. I should close that off properly. OK, so what is this? Well, let's draw some. So we're going to have something in R1. We're going to have something in R2. Maybe I'll put something here in R3. Um, it's clear what the origin is in these two, but I'm just going to mark 0 here. OK. So here, well, we only have one coordinate. The sum of it has to equal 1. So it's going to be here. So this point is the standard 0 simplex. In R2, well, we'll have this point and this point. So it's 1 and 1. I should write that 1. And we have everything between here. So this is the standard 1 simplex. And in R3, again, we have the 1s. And then it's this space here. And that's the two dimension, standard two-dimensional simplex. OK, and then when you go three-dimensional, it's a tetrahedra. And then it's higher and higher dimensional tetrahedra. Um, you might say that it's the convex subspace of Rn plus 1 sta spanned by the standard basis vectors. It has n plus 1 vertices, one for each of the standard basis vectors. Um, and the ith vertex is 1 in the ith coordinate and 0 otherwise. And that's why I numbered my coordinates from 0 rather than from 1. OK. Now, let's switch cameras. Almost forgot. All right, so we're going to fix a space x. All right, and we're going to define we Find a simplicial set. So what I mean by simplicial set, I mean that the category C that I'm going into is um, set. So that is, it's a functor, and, um, which I'll call Sx, which goes from delta op into the category of sets. All right, what do we need to do? We need to say what it is on objects. So we're going to let Sxn 
be equal to the set of maps from the standard n simplex into x in top. So that's continuous maps from the standard in sim n simplex into our topological space. So SX0 just picks out a point. SX1 picks out paths. SX2 picks out triangles. Um, no, I'm just saying continuous. So these can be like singular. They can overlap. They can, they can be unpleasant. They, can, they don't have to be smooth or anything. They just have to be continuous. OK. And we're, now we need, just need to say what happened, what the face and degeneracy maps are. So um, I'm going to define two things first. I'm going to define alpha and i to be a map from the standard n minus 1 simplex to the standard n simplex which sends all right so so things elements in here are some have some coordinates x0 up to xn minus 1 and this is going to go to x0 up to x i minus 1 and 0 and x i then to x n minus 1. And you should think of these for each i, what we're doing is we're including a face. So yes, the faces of the one simplex are copies of the zero simplex. The faces of the two simplex are copies of the one simplex. And that continues on up. All right. And we're going to define beta. That's a terrible beta. Um, and i going in the other direction. So this is going to go from the n plus 1 simplex, plus one simplex to the n simplex. And that's going to take x0 up to xn plus 1. Uh, and this is going to look a little bit weird. I'm going to go to x0 up to xi minus 1, up to xi plus xi plus 1, to xi plus 2, and then up to x n plus 1. So we're just picking a spot. The i picks a spot to add two of the coordinates together so that you only have n plus 1 or n, yeah, n plus 1 coordinates. OK. <coughs> All right. OK, now we can define our um, maps by then we define din applied to some thing in here to be um, pre-composition by alpha n. So this is now a map from delta n minus 1 to delta n to x, which is what we want it to be. And we have s i n delta going to delta precomposed with beta ni, which is from delta n plus 1 to delta n to x. So that's what we needed. So I should also say that we might call um, these the n simplices of the simplicial set. Like elements of that set, we'd call the rn simplices. OK. And last, I want to say this satisfies the 
simplicial identities. And now I'm going to quote Emily Real. Mercifully, the required relations are often obvious. And even if they are not, it is advisable to assert that they are after privately verifying that they do in fact hold. Or to quote my supervisor Viglik, some things you shouldn't do in public. <laughs> so exercise, check that. All right. Uh, and now we're going to move on to, so um, this is a particularly uh, important thing in algebraic topology. Um, I don't think that I will go into it now, uh, but the when you take homology of a space, which is an important topological invariant, what you do is you have a functor from topological spaces. You go to simplicial sets via this functor S. So S, S, in fact, is a functor on topological spaces, taking you from topological spaces to simplicial sets. And then actually, you can take your simplicial set and abelianize the sets. So on each set, you generate, each set, you freely generate an abelian group. And that gets you a simplicial abelian group. So actually, maybe I'll just leave these out. Um, and then you can turn that into a chain complex over Z. In fact, you really turn it into a chain, chain complex that only has interesting things happen from 0 up. And then homology is a functor out of that. Um, and the fact is that homology captures it captures less homotopy information um, than you might like. And the reason is because of this in the middle, this linearization in the middle. All right, but that's, I'm not going to talk too much about that. When you do this um, in the algebraic topology course, you just go from here to here. And you sort of ignore this stuff in the middle. Uh, but implicitly, that's what's happening. All right. Um, now I want to talk about limits and co-limits. Uh, and I think I'm just going to erase from here so I can use these last four boards. Unfortunately, I might need to use greens because I need lots of colors. Um, so apologies to anyone watching on the recording because green hasn't been showing up very well. All right. So we're going to define a category. We're going to define the category of cones for 20 blaze it. So we're going to start with some functor f from C to D, um, a cone over F is a pair. All right. And it's a pair, say, Z and maps from Z to the image of F and D 
for each object y and c. So it's a pair. The pair is one object. Um, where, so where z is an element of d and phi y is in d as well. So z is an object. This second thing is a collection um, containing one morphism in D for each object in Y and in C. All right. Such that, so this has to satisfy some, something. And I want Z, Fx, Fy. Now I'm just going to use the colors that I've got here. All right. So, such that phi x, phi y, commute with f of f for all f, for all maps in C. All right. So I'm using green to note this collection. So what does this look like? Well, suppose that my, my category C uh, looks like this. Fortunately, the recording only picks up the things that I say. Well, sort of fortunately. It means it doesn't hear questions, but that's at least it's not going to hear that. So what is a co so think about this as being your category C. Now you can think about this as the, the you can think about this as the image of C in D under F. OK, so what do I want from my cone? OK, it's going to have an object that I'm going to call Z. And it has morphisms from Z to the images of objects in C. So it has these. And this condition just says that each triangle that you can make here commutes. So when you pick two of these green legs, if there's a red arrow, then that triangle has to commute. So this is a cone over f. And you can really see that it is like a cone over the image of that, of that functor. All right, but I said, that, I said that this was a category. So I need to tell you something about morphisms. And I need to pick one spot to put my markers. All right, so. A morphism of cones, so this is going to go from, um, say, W phi y to Z, sorry, psi y to phi y, OK, is a map. G from W to Z in D such that, all right, I want W, I want Z, I want FY. Now I want some more colors. So I'm going to use orange for G. And I'm already using green for um, the cone from Z. And I'll use blue for the cone from W. All OK, so what is this? Well, I have this cone W, which I'll put here. It looks the same as a cone from 
z, so it's also like this. And it has some commutativity triangles that it has to satisfy. All right, and now what's a morphism between here? A morphism is a map here in the category D such that, now what's this? This is saying that at each image of an object in C under F, I have a triangle. So there are two, there's a leg coming in from each cone, and then the third leg is this map. And so it's asking for each of these to commute. And so to have such a map, I really am saying that the cone W factors through the cone Z. Because all of the, all of the leg maps of W factor through the relevant leg maps of Z. All right. And finally, we can say that all right, so I've defined a morphism. Uh, the identity is the ident is is the identity on these objects, and you have to have the same cones. Uh, composition is you compose these in the in the category D, um, and you can check that that is a category. Um, and then a limit of F. is a terminal object in the category of cones over f. So what does that mean? That means that, say, this w um, this this thing this here is a limit if for every other cone over f z there is a unique such map like this. All right. So uh, we write. Okay. So people will often write that the limit of f say in this case, is w, right? But the limit really is this information, is all of this information. It's not just the object. Oh, yes, the limit is z, thank you. Sorry. It's the terminal object. No, no, but in this, in, from what I've drawn, I'm asking for, for it to be z. And similarly to when we, do uni when we talked about universal properties, um, it's a limit because it's only unique up to unique isomorphism, which is as unique as you want a thing to be. But, but it's not, yeah. All right, so now we're going to quickly talk about the dual thing. So a co-cone under F is also a pair. So is, let's, I'll use the same stuff that I've used here, is, we'll say, um, A, and OK, maybe I'll use the same thing I've used here, is A and phi Y. But now this is mapping from the image into the into the um, the object so this is from fy into a for all y and c um, again a is in d uh, by y is in d all right such that, OK, this is a dual construction, so we're just turning it around. So now we're going to put A on the bottom. We're going to put F x here, F y here. Uh, and now we'll put our green arrows here. This will be uh, by 
x. This would be phi y. This is ff. This is a, so I'm asking for this to commute again. So I should say that this needs to commute. Um, <coughs> and a morphism between co-cones. So I'm going to go from A. A, A, phi, y, to B, psi, y, uh, is a map, I'll use, maybe I'll use H this time, is a map H from A to B such that, OK, we've got A, we've got B, We've got f of, say, y. And now I'm using green for this. So that's phi of y. I'm using blue for this. So that's psi of y. And I'll use orange again for this map. So this is h. And I'm again asking for this to commute. And so we, we can do a similar drawing. I have A here. It has maps to it from the image now. I have B here. It has maps to it from the image, because it's also a cocone. And a map between these things. So. So asking for A to be a cocone is asking for these triangles to commute whenever I have two of these green ones and a red one that makes a full triangle. And now asking for this to be a cocone is saying that, OK, every, for every object in the image, it has two arrows coming out of it to the respective objects in the cocone. And I want that to commute with this map. And now, a co-limit of f is an initial co-cone. So now, a is the co-limit, or this co-cone with a in it is the co-limit if for any other co-cone b, with those maps, there is a unique such map to it. I will, yes. Um, so again, we would write colim of f is equal to a with the information of these maps. And mostly, you'll leave out the information of those maps. In most cases, it's implicit. It's like. Um, with, the, with the common constructions, it's clear what those maps should be, and so you don't need to include them. All right. So, um, oh, I can fit them on this board still. Um, oh, maybe I want to do one. Yeah, no, I'm going to switch cameras. <coughs> All right. So let's raise this stuff. All right. So let's do some examples. So in the first instance, I'm going to consider the 
category. Let's say C to be the category with two objects, two identity morphisms, and no other morphisms. So what is, what's, a, what's a functor from C into D? Well, it picks, so let's say F, it picks two objects, X and Y, out of D. And the, the only morphisms in here go to the identity morphisms on them. So that's all of the information it contains. So then what is the image? of this functor look like in this category, it looks like x, y. So what's a cone over this, over this thing? It's, um, I really shouldn't have used green. All right, anyway, um, a cone over this is an object z together with maps into x and y. And because there are no non-identity maps here, there's no triangles that we need to check. If we have some other, he's blue, if we have some other cone over this um, functor, what does it look like? It looks like this. So what does it mean for this z cone to be the terminal cone here. It means that there's a unique map such that these triangles commute. But this is the universal property of a product. So once you've picked where these two go, the limit limit of f is the product of x and y. All right, now if we do the dual thing, I'm going to have a and a cocone under this functor looks like this. All right, so if I have another cocone and I ask what the initial object in this category of cocones is, this is the universal product property of a coproduct. So this is the universal property of a coproduct. So the co-limit of F is the coproduct of x and y. All right, so now we've seen some other examples. If we have a functor from the category with three objects and the only non-trivial morphisms, non-identity morphisms look like that, into a category of into some category C, then uh, this just picks out some objects and some maps A, B, C. Really, it just picks out these two maps that start in the same place. And the co-limit of F, let's say this is F and this is G, is the push out of this diagram, which is something we described the universal property for last time. And the cones are precisely, well, you put an object here, you have an arrow from each of these, but then any arrow from here has to commute with that and commute with that. So you don't really need to specify the information of that arrow. All right. Similarly, if we have a map from a category, sort of the dual category, where we've turned these arrows around, the limit 
of f is a pullback. All right. And the last example that I wanted to do before we got to my last page was, OK, so we can have, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about a specific functor now. So I'm going to put a functor from n plus underline op to abelian groups. And now when I say n plus, I'm talking about the partially ordered set of natural numbers, not including 0. So, it's, so this category looks like 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on, with an object for each natural number, except I've put op there. So instead, it's arrows up to 1. Okay, which is to say I've just reversed the partial order. And this, this functor that I'm specifying is two abelian groups. And so I'm going to, so this functor is going to look like this. It's going to go to Z, P. There's a, an obvious in surjective homomorphism from Z, P squared, and similarly from Z, P cubed, and similarly from um, actually, maybe I'll. And that continues to ZPN and so on. And then the limit, so this is a functor. In, this is the image in abelian groups of, of where this, this gets sent. The limit of this functor F is ZP and the p-adic integers. Sorry? Uh, yes, this is a profinite group. Um, wait, is it? I'm not sure. Um, I think it might need to be a co-limit instead of a limit. I'm not sure. Um, but profinite groups are groups that are built out of finite groups as either a limit or a co-limit, and I don't remember. All right, so exercise. Check that these are the same as the universal property that we described the other day. And look up a definition of ZP. Um, look up, look up a, a, a point set definition and see if you can check that this satisfies the universal property that, that, that um, is described by this being a limit. So when the other day when I said the universal properties were you could build them as from categories, like, like in these cases, the categories that you build them off are like co-cones and cones. Right? OK. Now I have only a little bit left to say, um, which is good, because I think we're probably over time. Oh, we have still got 20 minutes. All right. Um, there's my razor. There it is. Now I'll switch to here. Oh, come on, just go up. Thank you. All right. Honestly, that's probably enough information for what I want to say now. OK, so something I commented on, but um, just want to make clear. So we have, we have 
a category cat whose objects are small categories. And whose morphisms are functors. Why do we want to talk about this as a separate category from the category cat whose objects are categories and whose morphisms are functors? And the reason is because in this top case, the thing that we get back is locally small. That is, it's what we usually think of as a category. The collection of morphisms between any two of the categories is a set. And in this case, we don't have that. It's not something that most, most people would say, oh, that's not a category. And category theorists would be like, it's not a, small, it's not a locally small category. Um, all right, so composition, because I've been sort of saying what I've been using composition of functors, but haven't explicitly said what it was. So you have some functors between categories f and g. And the codomain category of f is the domain category of g. Then you can form their composition, gf. And what does it do? Well, it has to be a functor, so gf of x is g applied to f of x. And so we just drop the parentheses and write gfx. It doesn't matter. All right. And similarly, gf of f from x to y is g applied to f of f from f of x to f of y. And so we write gf f goes from gfx to gfy. All right. Uh, and the identity is the thing that the identity functor is the obvious thing. So id c is a functor from c to c, which sends an object to itself, and it sends a morphism to itself. OK, great. And now. We can ident now we can actually define what an isomorphism of categories is. And I'm not going to because it's a bad definition. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not a notion that you want. Uh, if you have an identity of categories, if you sit down and think what that means, if you have an isomorphism of categories, if you sit down and think what that means, that literally means that you're taking the category and renaming everything. Like you've just given. You have the same objects and the same morphisms, but they have different names. That's all it means to have an isomorphism of categories. And that's somehow too strong a definition, or too strong a condition. All right. But we'll see next time um, what the correct notion of, of sort of sameness between categories is. All right. So last, we're going to talk about a thing that I care about, but I don't know if it will come up again. Um, so let f be a functor from a to c, and g be a functor from b to c. The comma category which we will write f arrow g for. Um, and it's called a comma category because this used to be a comma. That's literally the only reason. Uh, this notation is significantly better. All right, so we want to say what objects it has. It has as objects a triple, alpha, beta, f, where, where alpha is an object of A, of category A. Beta is an object of the category B. And f is a map from f alpha to g beta in C. OK. And then a morphism 
is a pair. So we want to say what a, a morphism between alpha, beta, f, and alpha prime, beta prime, f prime is. So it's a pair, is a pair, say, sigma omega. That's an omega, right? Yeah. yeah, OK. Where sigma is a map from alpha to alpha prime in A, omega is a map from beta to beta prime in B, and we want the following. So we want f alpha g beta f, f alpha prime, g beta prime, f prime. So we want this to be f of omega, and this to be g, sorry, of sigma, and this to be g of omega, and we want this to commute. All right. So a common category is a, is a category with these as objects and these as morphisms. Um, and say slice categories and co-slice categories are examples of these. Uh, and I like them. There are good reasons to think about them. They generalize a lot of um, sort of arrow categories that people think about. Uh, but we probably aren't going to do anything with this going forward. I just wanted to put it on the board. All right, that's it for today. Thanks, guys.